Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1972 film Vampire Circus, and it's a Hammer film, and when I watched it and I'm doing this review, it's available for streaming on Shudder, so I would recommend that. Now, I will admit that this, I don't know, this might be my very first Hammer film I've ever seen. I know a lot of people are probably hearing that right now and being like, what, and you're a horror fan? That's kind of been one of my blind spots. Uh, I've only kind of go gone back so far with horror films, and I've been dipping into the 70s, but I need to go back much further. Some of my main blind spots that I really need to remedy are Hammer films and Universal horror films. Um, but I'm trust me, I'm going to end up working on that. It takes time. Uh, I'll get there. So Vampire Circus. This one, I had seen the trailer for it, and it really caught my interest, and... It's a fun film. I, I think it's very solid. I'm kind of impressed with how it looked and how it was executed for being that early in the 70s. Um, but, you know, I, I know that Hammer has a, a awesome reputation for what they were able to do back then, really pumping out some good stuff. So this one was directed by Robert Young, uh, who had, he's done a bunch of older films, but the most important film that I want to point out which I actually don't like but it has like one particularly good sequence in it and I know a lot of people like it's kind of like one of those bad films but people the guilty pleasure the 2014 film Ghost Ship Robert Young directed this in 1972 and then in 2014 directed Ghost Ship that's interesting now this was actually Robert Young's first feature length film and for that reason there was some confusion that happened between he and Hammer. Uh, I guess Hammer didn't clearly communicate to him or something, but he didn't know about how Hammer kind of ran their production and that they ran a very tight production that was relatively quick. So this film was actually supposed to only go six weeks for filming and everything, and Young didn't know that, so he was really taking his time with shots and trying to do as best he can, which I would say that shows in the film because it looks good from a technical standpoint for 1972. It looks really good, good directing, good camera work for the most part, good acting. I mean, it looks great. The, the practical effects look good for that time period. Um, yeah, visually nice. But, uh, apparently one of the things he got caught up on was a scene where a tiger bites a fake human arm and they spent a lot of time kind of working on that, trying to set that up properly because the tiger wouldn't actually bite. Now, they filled the fake arm with pork, and the tiger wasn't going for it, so after enough frustration, they switched to beef, and that's when they, that solved the problem. But, you know, setting up shots like that, he was taking too much time. So once he crossed into his seventh week of filming, Hammer stepped in and just shut the production down and said, you're done, this is how we run it, hand us all the footage. Then they took all the footage and they handed it off to an editor and said, look, make a movie out of this. So it wasn't even really completed, at least not from the perspective of Robert Young, the director. So two things. One, I would be interested to, to have seen what Robert Young's full vision was for this film. That would have been really interesting. But two, uh, I'm actually impressed with the fact that the film comes together as well as it does and is coherent and is as good as it is knowing now that it wasn't even really finished. So that's kind of impressive as well. So I don't know if that speaks mainly to, you know, he just happened to, to shoot enough that it was good enough or it speaks to how the editor was able to do or a combination of the two. But that's, I mean, it's pretty cool. Um, it was written by Jude, uh, Ju I'm sorry, Judd Kinberg, who did uh, such scripts as Reach for Glory, Siege of the Saxons, East of Sudan, and The Sellout, all order, older films, obviously. Um, and let's get into... The, oh, so this film actually didn't do well. Sorry for the pause in that. This film actually didn't do that well when it came out, but it actually has done much better as time's gone on, and it's, you know, gained more of a viewership and, and following. And it's actually considered nowadays to be one of the more intelligent and stylish of the Hammer films, which is very interesting. And that and that's one of those things, is that there's, there's this interesting situation where there are plenty of films that when they come out, they don't do that great, and people are just like, Pfft. But then over time, people look back on them, and they're like, oh, this was actually a really great film back then. Um, and then it gets, you know, revived in a way 
finds its audience over time. So now the the actual stuff about the movie, which spoilers, yes, spoilers, because it's a very old film. Uh, my first my first inkling with the way that this starts was, uh oh, a family in the woods. This stuff never goes well, especially for older horror films. So I knew something was afoot. I'm sure everyone who was watching knew that. And they actually, they don't waste a whole lot of time getting into the sexuality of the vampires because there's a graphic for that time sex scene going on pretty immediately between the Count and Anna, I think her name was, uh, the one character's wife. Um, yeah, uh, there's plenty of nudity in this. There's a lot of sexuality to it, which, you know, it makes sense. It goes along with vampires because va vampires over time had been turned into these very sexual beings and having this ability to you know, charm people, draw them in with their, with their, you know, looks, their glamour, their charisma, whatever you want to call it. But it was just a little bit, not, I wouldn't say shocking, but it was a little bit unexpected for me that I saw them get into the sex that heavily that early on in the film. But I also know that, you know, Hammer films do have a good amount of nudity and sex to them, as I've been told. Um, so it appears that Anna was bringing victims to the Count in exchange for sex, is kind of what it seemed like. And I kind of don't know, like, what degree, to what degree it was that she was kind of being, like, charmed by him, or, you know, mind-controlled by him, or was it just her actually wanting to be with him for some other reason? I don't know. I mean, I would assume it was some sort of, you know, supernatural persuasion that was at play here, but I thought that was interesting. But it seems like the exchange literally is for sex. At least that's how the setup seems. This is a pretty action-packed and fun way to start the film, and it really brings you right in. I mean, they really wasted no time with the kid getting killed and the sex happening and then the villagers storming the castle and fighting the Count. There's a good fight scene with the Count. He takes out a bunch of people. I mean, he was really wrecking for a while until he finally gets you know stabbed through the back, through the heart, which looked relatively effortless for, for what it would have actually been. Uh, I thought that was kind of funny. When the circus finally rolls into town, you actually get this feeling that it's going to be fun. Like, there's an air of fun that comes to it. Not within the story, but from a viewer's perspective of, this is a film that I'm watching. Like, knowing it's a film, not immersing yourself in the story necessarily. Like, you know the fun's about to start because... It's a fun premise, and circuses are fun, and they go they definitely go down that road with the performances that they end up showing a lot, which they didn't need to show that many of the performances, but I think it actually adds to the film. Some pe people could say it was kind of filler, but I actually love those portions of the film. It's fun. They're quirky. They're kind of weird, but um, yeah, they're a good time. You do get some immediate suspicion that's kind of cast on the circus because of when they show up, their attitudes are very brash. They're very kind of like, whatever. Then there's also the aspect of, there was that roadblock, and people are like, how did you get past that roadblock? Which gives you an idea that this is not a normal circus. And then there's also the fact that they know there's an illness in the town, yet they're showing up to entertain. So that's another thing to it, where it just doesn't... A lot of things that just don't make sense from a normal circus perspective. And then also, the title of the film, obviously. Which... It's a fun title, but also kind of weird. The scene with the guy getting shot at and then he stops and says that he's going to turn around, I think is really funny when he was going to, you know, make a run at the roadblock and then they start shooting at him and he, he's like yelling, he's like, okay, I'm turning around, I'm turning around. I thought that was funny. It seemed it was shot in a funny way. So the town is cool with kids seeing this erotic dance performance that was happening at the very first show that the circus did. Because literally, like, there are all these kids in the audience there, and nobody seems to have a problem with this very sexual dance going on with the woman who was all body painted up as a tiger, and you could see her vagina even spread it at points, and you could see her boobs, obviously, and it was just like... It was just a weird thing that like every, everyone was just like, mm -hmm, yep, and that's the uh, that's the entertainment, and uh, yep, Billy over here, totally fine for him. He's like five years old, he gets it. <laughs> it's just weird. Um, you can feel the town's paranoia in this, and I think that's something good about the way it was shot, the way it was acted, the way it was scripted, is that they do a good job of kind of revisiting the paranoia going on, revisiting these townsfolk continually talking about what's really going on, trying to guess, 
there's even something thrown out about rabies at one point. You know, it, it, it's interesting because it gives you an idea that, like, they don't fully know what's going on. But throughout the whole thing, they also keep bringing up, and it seems like it's just this kind of cloud that hangs over about the curse that the Count had put on him. Which, by the way, I didn't know that, you know, vampires putting curses on people was a thing. I had always associated that with witches. But I don't have a problem with that in this, this film. I don't. I never have a problem with people introducing new things into the mythology of a creature like a vampire. Um, unless it's stupid. But with the curse thing, it's fine. Like, it works. It sets up the film, and I don't think it's problematic. It was just, I, it was just the first time I'd kind of seen something like that. Especially from an older film. Because I, I felt like back then they were really following a lot of the rules that had been set up. So, um, do the Burgermeister, which, what is that? Like, I don't get what a Burgermeister is. I just thought it was funny. And when they first said it, I thought they said Boogermeister. Like, it literally sounded like Boogermeister. Uh, that, with the Burgermeister, when he starts losing it in front of the, uh, mirrors of life, <laughs> I thought that was over the top. That's one of those moments where I was just like, okay, they definitely should have, you know, Pulled this back a little bit. I understand acting has only gotten better over time, but it was a choice by the director to let that go on that long of him just, like, ridiculously laughing. And I guess maybe it was partially, like, something supernatural making him do that, but it was it was a little much. For having to use a fake panther during that one attack scene in the woods and it being in the 70s, that attack scene actually was done pretty e effectively. The, it was, and it was a lot in the camera work. Like, you could tell at times, like, kind of quickly that the fake panther didn't look that good. But they were able to move the camera enough and, you know, cut it together well enough and have enough gore to it that it actually ended up being effective. And I was kind of impressed with how good it really looked, given the parameters at that point. Uh, the shot of the boot buckles. There are a few really awesome shots in this. Now, the boot buckles in the woods when the woman's kind of like trying to hide, when they're far away and out of focus and they look like cat eyes, that's an awesome shot. That looks really cool. And then it comes into focus as it's moving forward and you see it's these boot buckles. That was cool. That's a very awesome inspired shot. And I love that. The town is dealing with a lot. The illness, the roadblock, and the circus and that further makes the audience member feel it, like feel the paranoia, feel the frustration, just feel all the terrible stuff, the burden that the town itself is going through. Um, there was a point where there were blood, splot, blood spots showing up quickly on the Count's body when he was still dead, and some of the vampires were feeding around him. Now, I understand that was supposed to be like he's, you know, gaining some of that blood somehow, which is weird. Like, I don't understand how, like, other vampires feeding on people would bring the Count back to life. Like, that actually doesn't make sense to me, and I think that's stupid. That is one of those dumb things. Um, so I don't like that. All, and then also to go along with that when those, little, like, blood sp spots were showing up on the body, that actually didn't look good. And they could have just done without that overall so uh what the hell did the animals do when the the few townsfolk go around and like they shoot the monkey and they shoot the tiger and it's like wouldn't they be going after the actual perpetrators of what they think is going on not the animals because obviously the animals didn't have anything to do with it unless they were assuming that the animals were also people in disguise because of emile being able to turn into a black panther I don't know. But it just didn't make sense to me. I'm like, why are they killing the animals? The animals didn't do anything. They've been in cages the whole time. Especially, specifically, the monkey and the tiger. It's weird. Uh, I'm not understanding... Oh, I already talked about that. How I don't understand about, you know, other vampires sucking blood doing anything for the count. Uh, the strong man. While he does have a little bit more of a role towards the end of the film, he doesn't have a whole lot of a role. He's kind of just there. And I kind of wanted to see more from him because he was, he could have been a more interesting character, but the fact that they just have him there for the muscle and look imposing and not speak at all is, um, I don't know, underutilization because all the other characters had more to do for the most part. I just wanted to see more from the strong man. 
Uh, although one of the scenes I loved with the strong man is when he gets shot eventually at the end and there's that giant hole that gets blown in his back and they show it quickly enough that it looks really good. And it also looks shocking because it's this giant hole that gets blown in his back. I love that scene. Um, a great line from this film that shows the level of danger with these vampires and how potentially unstoppable they are is when it, they, the one says, then tear it from her neck, talking about having the um, cross necklace on, one of the women they were going after. Um, I thought that was a really good line, the way it was delivered, the way it was written, and also just the implications, like I was saying, of that doesn't necessarily stop them. They, they can just get rid of these religious symbols that are supposed to keep them at bay. So it ups the ante for the film. I really dig the shot of Emil going up the stairs, and as he's going up the stairs, his legs turn into panther legs, and then the panther finishes going up the stairs. Another one of those really cool, really well done inspired shots. Loved it. Loved that one. The giant cross impaling the female twin was a cool scene that I did not see coming. Also, the aspect of it, that little twist of the fact that she gets it, then the male twin also ends up with this giant hole in his chest. That was cool as well. I really like that. Creative, well done. The crossbow string decapitation may be my favorite thing in the actual film because I didn't see it coming and it looked really cool and it's a great kill idea for a film like this. Um, that was awesome. I mean, very inventive. Dug it. It's kind of a small thing, a very small thing I'm sure a lot of people would say, but I really like how long and particularly pointy the fangs in this are. You know, you, you see different vampire films and they have different types of fangs. That I think I feel like it's more popular that they're more shorter and chunkier type vampire fangs. But this one, especially with like the count, they're very long and they're vi they get very slender at the end. They're almost like hypodermic needles, which makes you, um, I don't know, they just look more menacing that way. But they also look more sleek. They're good. I dig it. Another thing that you should notice is that the casting for the vampires, for the most part, they're all, they all have relatively pointy facial features. It was an aesthetic choice to kind of go with a sleekness, a more ambiguous um, sexuality type lean to it. Because even the men look a, a bit feminine. And I think that speaks kind of like to, to the, um, the charisma, the the draw of vampires in general. I, they have this oozing of sexuality, and it's not just towards women. It can also be a little bit alluring to men as well. So I just thought that was interesting to note that their casting of it was all a bunch of, you know, more pointed features like that. Uh, this, this film ends up speaking to the fears of doing something that leads to a lasting negative effect with your family, but also more to, to society at large. That's kind of a fear that people have that if they need to take action on something, that are they doing the right thing? Are they doing the right thing just for them at that time and not long term? Or are they doing the right thing in general and it will pay off? Because in the beginning, you see that the townsfolk are very concerned about what can happen with the count if they actually take action. But then in the end, they take action, but then they suffer the consequences for that because the curse ends up happening. And then that's this, like I was saying before, this cloud just over top of the entire town for a long time. And that leads to a lot of hardship, the illness, the roadblock, you know, literally they're stuck in their town at that point. And then the circus rolls in of vampires and they're preyed upon. So it creates this horrible situation. And a lot of the townsfolk, if you notice in the beginning, well, not a lot, but a decent amount, we're willing to just walk away and just be like, look, the count will have us killed. You know, this isn't going to end well. We're just going to go back to our lives. But they took action. And in the end, after everything is done, um, paid off. They, they took care of it. Anyway, that's all I have to say about this film. I enjoyed it. I had a fun time. It's not perfect. It's not the best, whatever. Uh, but out of five stars with half stars in play, I'm going to give it a very solid three and a half star rating. I dig it. I would recommend it to people. Um, I am going to recommend it to some people, actually. And it gets me even more jazz to check out more Hammer films. So um, look for that on my channel. Not necessarily in the super near future, but I'll get to it. It'll happen. Trust me. 
But anyway, thanks for checking this out. Put some comments down there. Let's talk about this film and other Hammer films. Actually, it'd be great if you could give me recommendations for particular Hammer films that you think I would like or that you would like to see me review. Um, whether it's because they're really good or they're particular, but particularly bad, I'm fine with either. But do me a quick favor, hit that subscribe button because uh, that's your best way to repay me if you like any videos that I do on this channel. Um, I'm just doing this for free. So whenever I see someone subscribe, I feel a great amount of gratitude. It really does mean a lot to me. So I would appreciate that. But also hit the notification bell if you're going to do that. And that way it'll let you know whenever I'm putting up a new review video or doing a live stream or anything like that. But regardless, thanks for taking your time to watch this. And until next time, keep it brutal.